This is Kentucky Afield Radio. This is Ron Rohde, Kentucky Afield's first host back in 1953. Now, I'm proud to present Charlie Baglin. Travel. We all do it. Where is it we are going to or getting away from? One famous quote says, not all who wander are lost. We talk with a wildlife biologist from Kentucky who spent his summer in Kenya. We go inside outdoors to see what he saw and how it's opened his eyes to the work he does back home with the Kentucky chapter of the Nature Conservancy. And resisting the temptation to tame the wild on Kentucky Afield Radio. In the news, whales have been spotted in Kentucky waters. We have an expert standing by on the water's edge. There goes the bobber. (laughs) Set the hook. (gasps) Daddy, it's a whale. Way to go, buddy. Childlike wonder for the outdoors. It still exists. Where to go, what to take, and how to get started are waiting at the Kentucky Fish and Wildlife website, fw.ky.gov. Take a kid fishing. Don't let the opportunity get away. I don't know what you mean by skipper. Skipper? Skipper. 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 Hey, skipper. What? Don't skip the life jackets. Life jackets. You're right. Thanks for the reminder. Water officers everywhere remind you, your life jackets got your back. And the backing of everyone that wants you to come home alive. So, skipper, don't skip the life jackets. A public service message from your Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife. This is Kentucky Afield Radio, and by the very name of the show, Kentucky Afield, it's sort of limited to what's going on in Kentucky, bordered by our seven border states. But the truth of the matter is, we have many animals that live here that actually come from Canada or fly as far south as northern South America. Animals don't always recognize border crossings, nor do wildlife biologists. It's good to get up and get out and get away and take a look at how the other half lives and come home with a little better appreciation for what you have right here. And my guest, Jeffrey Dale Soul, has had quite a journey with his wife, Carol. He is with the Kentucky chapter of the Nature Conservancy, a fellow whose work I have admired for many years. There's not a lot of people you talk to who say, what you've been doing? Oh, I just got home from Africa. <laughs> what were you doing there? Well, it, it was strictly a vacation, so it was not a work-related trip. As a matter of fact, it's the most uh, of an actual vacation I've probably ever taken where I did not do any work while I was gone. But it was a great trip. Uh, we were gone for a total of about 25 days, uh, 21 days on the ground in Kenya, um, traveling around the country of Kenya, and it was... Uh, primarily a birding trip where we we focused on trying to see how many of the bird species of Kenya we could locate. Is that something you just wake up one morning and say, I think I'll go to Kenya and see how many bird species I could catch? There has to be some planning to this. A lot of planning, but uh, fortunately that was done by somebody else. <laughs> so <laughs> or it you... probably wouldn't have went so well. We, we, uh, what, what really happened with us... Um, is we were fortunate in uh, meeting a young man who actually was born in Zimbabwe, um, he, and then he later his family moved to Kenya. He grew up in Kenya, and he came over here and went to the University of Kentucky um, to get a degree in uh, environmental resources. And he was a, a, a super birder, liked to get out and, and look for birds in Kentucky, and I got to know him over the last couple of years. And it turns out that uh, his name is Stratton Hatfield. And Stratton um, would go back home to Kenya in the summer times, and he worked as a, a guide for safari companies, you know, looking at the big game and the big animals and so forth. But his true passion is birding. And at least uh, initially here out of college, he is thinking about, uh, you know, getting into guiding for birding, people that like to go birding, uh, as a profession and so we were his first uh, official trip that he had totally organized and set up and uh, and he did a fantastic job he beta tested on you and came through with flying colors absolutely were you more impressed with his country or he more impressed with ours here in the united states what do you think oh you know that'd be a tough call um 
Is it apples and oranges, or, or is this state more like foreign countries than you may realize? I, I'm, I've not been to Kenya to know. Well, it's apples and oranges for sure, comparing Kentucky to Kenya. I've been on a couple other trips out of the country where I think there are a lot of similarities. Uh, and that would be more like Costa Rica or Guatemala. Kenya, uh, the, the big thing there that just really was awe-inspiring and took me sort of by surprise, I guess. I wasn't expecting it to be as awe-inspiring as it was. It's just such a huge scale of the ecosystems that are still functioning and intact, especially the grassland ecosystems. And it can make you imagine what near the middle of the United States might have used to look like. What Kansas, Oklahoma may have been. And Nebraska and so forth, where where our prairies were. Those grassland systems in Kenya are still intact. They're still being, uh, I mean, there's a lot of development and things that are impacting those areas, but the scale of what is still intact there, uh, the Serengeti and so forth, is just truly amazing. These are words that we hear only when we're watching the National Geographic Channel. It's not; These aren't words we use in Kentucky every day, the Serengeti. I would imagine some of the animals that you were about to mention, we only would see in zoos or at Disney World. What did you see there? And I want to get into the bird part of it, but when you say habitats that are still intact, what did you see there? Uh, of the big impressive animals, I mean, we, we saw most everything that you might expect or hope to see. We were extremely lucky and saw things in one trip that many people go many times and still don't see so we were very lucky on our trip we saw uh, you know forest elephants and uh, savannah elephants Uh, we saw lions we saw a leopard we saw two different species of hyena jackals zebra lots lots of zebra there were two two species of zebra at least uh, that is what i recall off the top of my head right now but uh one of them was just called the common zebra, and, it, and it's uh, it's the most common around. There was another one called a grevy zebra, I believe, that was much less common, and we saw a few of those also. Gazelle? Gi- giraffes. Giraffes. Uh, giraffes were just, you know, they, they're they like alien species. They You look at them, and you think they're moving in f- slow motion because they're so big and graceful, but they're really moving at a pretty good clip when they're moving around, and just amazing animals. Uh, We did see gazelles. We saw uh, Thompson's gazelle, Grant's gazelle, uh, several other, you know, lots of different antelope species. Uh, We saw little tiny antelopes called dick dicks that were just hilariously funny. Hmm. We saw two fighting, which uh, uh, Stratton Hatfield, our guide, was, uh, it's the first time he'd ever seen that. But, you know, they were ramming their heads together and fighting and acting like they were big, ferocious animals, but uh, little tiny guys. You know, I I can imagine, because I've been to zoos and seen the animals you describe, but again, that was a zoo. I cannot imagine what you just saw when you say the expanse of these habitats, and these critters are not there behind walls or fences. They're there on their own. This is where habitat indeed is still in balance. Yeah, definitely uh, no fences. Uh, th- this is animals. These animals are wild, free roaming. Of course, huge migrations of a lot of these animals still take place. Lots of Cape buffalo, uh, wildebeest. Again, a lot of different types of antelopes, and I could refer to notes and, and probably name off a whole bunch more. But uh, just really impressive that these animals could be moving. You might look out across the big wide landscape and see you know, 10 or 15 different species of these animals at various points on the horizon or in between you and the horizon. So it was just really impressive. I think the scale of what you see there is just the most amazing part. What's the most expansive place you have seen during your work as a wildlife biologist in Kentucky? For some reason, the Peabody Wildlife Management Area comes to mind, but there could be any any number of others. Well, Peabody is definitely a you know a huge open landscape. Of course, it's highly altered. It was a coal mine, and as far as grasslands go, probably the most impressive grassland in Kentucky, and it's partially in Tennessee, is at Fort Campbell. And there are places you can go at Fort Campbell. There's a 
a fire tower that you can go on and look out over their uh, uh, bombing range where you're not allowed to go on foot or anything because of ordinances that, that are there. But uh, uh, you, know, you can probably look at a swath of grassland on Fort Campbell that's you know, a few miles wide and maybe 10 or 12 miles long. And you can pretty much look out and see it all. Wildlife biologist Jeff Sowell is my guest. We're talking about 25 days in the East African Serengeti. It's good to have an end to the journey, Ernest Hemingway says, but it's the journey that matters in the end. We'll have more in a moment on Kentucky Field Radio. This is Kentucky Field Radio. It's Charlie Baglin talking about travels. I have a wildlife biologist in the studio with me who has just been in eastern Africa, in the country of Kenya. The traveler sees what he sees. The tourist sees what they've come to see. And Jeff, it sounds like that your eyes were open as you and your wife traveled about Kenya. I want to hear more about the large-scale habitats. We're talking the huge large-scale habitats and where Kentucky fits in. You'd mentioned Fort Campbell. Where else? And then the other place might be, you know, on Pine Mountain or something when you're at the top of Pine Mountain or Black Mountain and you're just looking out over the overall Cumberland Mountains or Cumberland Plateau and it gives you a feeling of a big intact forest system. Uh, so, you know, that that could maybe sort of equate, but at the same time, it's very fractured with roads and things that you don't see over in where we were in Kenya. Uh, there you might be on what serves as a road most of them were were just barely trails uh, and you can park and look basically in a 360 degree circle and as far as you could see to the horizon would still be just a big grassland hmm. or a savanna or that sort of thing now now kenya's forest system is nearly totally gone so almost all of their forests have been cleared destroyed and that's where a lot of corn and ag crops and things are grown and a lot of people seem to live in those uh, more mountainous uh, areas that used to be really tropical forests Um, you think of Kenya being uh, Serengeti very dry desert but it's also on the equator Uh, we must have crossed the equator 10 or 15 times during our trip and we went to what should have been large uh, you know cloud forests very humid tropical forest systems that were mostly just very small remnants but we went there to try to find some special birds that that's the only place that are left in Kenya I never knew that you were a birder is that something you've always had an interest in well I'm, I mean you know I'm a wildlife biologist general ecologist outdoor person I've always had interest in birding um, I did not actively bird as aggressively as I do these days for years and years, but I've always birded some, kept a little bit of a you know a list of the birds I'd seen in Kentucky or in the United States. Uh, and then just in the last five to ten years, I've gotten more serious about birding as, as a way to go see other places. And so it's really the way uh, my wife Carol and I have begun to do a little traveling and we will go to a place using birding as a way to see the country, make sure you get around to all the different habitat types, uh, see what all is going on in a place. You can go to foreign countries and travel around to see architecture, take part in its culinary cuisine, if you like food, snow skiing, scenery foreign language, different currency. That is an experience that everyone should experience at some point in their life. And you did it because you wanted to see different habitats and birds. Was it something you wish you had a little bit more than 25 days to do? Certainly. <laughs> so is this type of trip, Jeff, something that you would recommend? Because I know you got to save your money for a, a day or two to be able to afford such a vacation. I you know I would recommend, highly recommend this to anybody anybody interested you know in in uh, the natural world especially and seeing uh, uh, huge grassland systems even more especially maybe uh, that are still intact 
and still functioning the way they should be. I would also highly recommend uh, the the young man I worked with. Uh, I don't know if he's going to stay in this and do this as a profession, but uh, he did just a super job. He grew up in the area, has local connections. Uh, his mom and dad are from Kentucky, and that's how he ended up coming back to the University of Kentucky for his edu- part of his education. You know, they went over there as missionaries years ago, you know, back in the 70s, and they've never come back. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Stratton was born there uh, in Zimbabwe, grew up in Kenya, uh, has dual citizenship, but... Uh, you know, so he's he's uh, in a lot of ways he's like talking with somebody from here in Kentucky because his mom and dad grew up here and he has those influences. But uh, over there, he speaks Swahili as fluently as anybody in the world, and uh, it was amazing just to you know his connections and the people he had that he could introduce us to and uh, the places he could show us. What did you bring back from there that you were going to apply? to your work with the Nature Conservancy, you think? Well, that's that's a really good question. Um, you know, the Nature Conservancy is also active in Kenya. Uh, it may be, I mean, there, there's things um, we've been considering at the Kentucky chapter of the Nature Conservancy, how we might help with the Africa program. And it wasn't specifically Kenya, but... Uh, We've been talking about that now for a number of years, and particularly with uh, some of our fire program. These grasslands have still, you know, over there they're still functioning largely with lightning fires and so forth, but there's beginning to be the effort we saw in the United States where fire suppression is starting to happen there. So they're starting to need that educational component about keeping fire in the system and not getting people used to it not being there like we have in the United States. So there may be some role that I can help play or the Kentucky chapter of the Nature Conservancy can help play with that in the future. As far as bringing things back from over there, um, you know, it's a, that's a tougher call. You know, what, what are they doing that we're not doing here or doing better? That's a, hard to say. It's just that their um, their systems are so huge. They have opportunity over there to work at much larger scales. I wish we had that here. <laughs> well, you can go to Montana, and you can see wildlife in balance and habitats intact. I want to say, am I wrong? I think that's right, but you still have, you know, there's efforts in Montana and South Dakota and North Dakota right now to do grassland prairie restoration at a large scale where animals could still could actually migrate and move and not have fences and roads and things that deter that movement. There's not really, maybe Yellowstone and you know some of that system at the national park level uh, where things are still functioning sort of at that scale. But um, that's still not quite big enough. It must be a big place over there. It's huge. <laughs> I, I would love to see it. Well, you need to. Uh, again, I recommend it to anybody. Um, you saw birds there. If we were in Kentucky, we're talking about blue jays, robins, cardinals, warblers, and red-headed woodpeckers. And and these words are just common. We have heard them all our life. But to Stratton Hatfield, who comes here, uh, those were new and foreign and exotic to him. And when you went to Kenya, the the birds you saw there, uh, you've never seen before. I trust that there are no birds that Kentucky shares in common with Kenya. Well, there are actually a few. Really? But very few. What are they? We, uh, While we were there, we, as I remember, we, uh, we ended up as a group, a birding group. Uh, we came up with about 650 species of birds in Kenya, which is a, a huge, that's a really good uh, effort. Um, I've got a note. Hang on. <laughs> I have a note. Brainerd Palmer Ball. Oh, yeah. With the Kentucky Ornithological Society, and uh, I would venture to say the state's authority on songbirds, birds, says 360 species will wander in and out of our state. They may not live here resident, but they will migrate in in the winter, fly home in the spring, that type of thing. And you're saying you saw 650? 
that's almost twice. Yeah, Kentucky's uh, bird numbers are right where you were talking, 360, 365, somewhere in that range, that birds that either live in, breed in Kentucky or migrate through our state. And Kenya probably has uh, 1,200 or so birds that migrate through or, you know, if you did a similar analysis for Kenya. So what we were looking at was mostly their resident breeding birds because the migration period for birds was largely over by the time we got there. And, and we, we, you know, we still missed a lot, but uh, we, we saw a tremendous number. Now you ask about commonality. Uh, there, there are just a few bird species that occur in the United States that you might see or you you could see in Kenya also uh, and we saw a couple of those one of them um, is in, osprey in, among them osprey is in Kenya we did not see one there was a turn of a black turn or one a Caspian turn is one that is here in Kentucky that is also in Kenya uh, you know just a very few but uh, my personal list for that trip was 615 birds, and 607 of those were birds I had never seen before. Hmm. So, you know, some people compete with other people, I guess, in birding and bird numbers, but really it's all about your your personal life list. Trying to come up, you know, see as many as you can, document it as well as you can. Um, and it's all at a personal level. J.D., we got to take a break. We'll talk about more similarities with Kenya and Kentucky and what we can learn from each other. This is Charlie Baglin. Stay with us. This is Kentucky Afield Radio. We're back on Kentucky Afield Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin. You can probably tell I like to travel. Don't do it as much as I would like. Some people don't like really to travel at all. They're homebodies. Some folks have had some astute things to say about travel. Kid is coming home from school, stops in the field, picks some wildflowers of some description, takes them home to his mother, hands them to her. Dear, she says, you could have picked the same flowers from our backyard. And the kid looks at her and says, but mom, the journey is part of the gift. So there are a lot of good things that can be said for traveling. Go someplace you've never been sometime. Doesn't have to be summer. It can be winter, fall, doesn't matter. Even if that's the next county over, invite someone to Kentucky that you haven't seen for a while from out of state and see your Kentucky from their perspective. Maybe invite them to go fishing. Hi, this is John Williams for the Fish Report for Southeast Kentucky at Lake Cumberland. I hope anglers are enjoying the full lake this year. Striped bass fishing has been good of late. Most of the fish are still in the creeks, anywhere from about 10 to 35 feet deep. Can be caught on drifting live bait, shad, rail wives. Also getting good size on those 25 to 30 inch fish. Also seen a few fish on the main lake, but mostly still in the creeks. Also in the district, Rock Creek and McCoy County will be stocked with trout this week. Uh, you can catch those with the inline spinners, a really good place uh, to take your family. And also in the district, I'd recommend some of our major streams or major rivers. Upper Cumberland River, Rock Castle, South Fork, Kentucky, and even some of the smaller streams are great this time of year for a variety of sunfish, smallmouth bass, rock bass. They can be called little rebel crawfish or small inline spinners, so give those a try. And as always, be safe and good fishing. This is Rob Rold in the Northwestern Fishery District with an update on some fishing opportunities in our area. Our two main lakes, Nolan River Lake and Ref River Lake, are both at summer pool, holding steady, and surface temps are running around the mid-70s. With the bass bite being slow, now is certainly the time to concentrate on fishing for bluegill, red ear, and channel catfish as they're all coming up shallow and getting ready to spawn. Look in the backs of coves, especially those with some gravelly shorelines and overhanging vegetation. Fish for them in a couple of feet of water. Both reservoirs also have a good population of channel catfish. Look on the steeper rocky banks. They'll be messing around the rocks, getting ready to spawn. Good baits are any kind of cut bait or commercially prepared stink bait. If you're searching out for the flatheads, make sure you use a live bait. Please remember to be safe on the water, but wear your life jacket. In western Kentucky, a lot of catfish being caught right now. Channel cats up in the embayments. Blue cat being caught down in the lower Cumberland, lower Tennessee rivers. Probably the best bait that I like is big old night crawler. Bass fishing, the bass have definitely moved off their beds and went back out to the ledges, so 
fishing those ledges for the bigger bass is definitely paying off with crankbaits, lizards, and jigs. But there's also still bass up shallow. There's still the small buck bass up there moving around and some decent bass to be caught around rocks. What I call it, rocks and docks. It's just any place you find a rocky shoreline, maybe a little bit of structure or a boat dock, good place to fish around. Crappie, again, they're done spawning, but we're still seeing a few up in the shallow around the stake beds fishing minnows and jigs. is still a good time. Red or bluegill, that's still pretty hot. Well, this is Paul Reister, and I hope you find a good day to go fishing. Kentucky Field Radio, Charlie Baglin, and we continue our conversation with Jeff Soule after the break. Helicopter rescue swimmer, Mike Bearski, United States Coast Guard. Chances are the Coast Guard wasn't there when you went overboard. But when you wear a Coast Guard-approved life jacket, we're closer than you think. Closer when you jet ski, fish, tube, canoe, kayak. There for close calls, when help isn't close at all. Kentucky conservation officers remind you, your life jacket's got your back. And the backing of the best swimmers everywhere. This is Kentucky Field Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin, and my mama always said, broaden your horizons. Well, my guest, Jeffrey Sowell, certainly knows that lesson. He and his wife, Carol, have just recently returned to the United States from safari in Africa, in Kenya. 25 days of bird watching and wildlife exploration. I have been familiar with Jeffrey Dale Sowell's passion for wildlife biology for more than two decades. And it's a pleasure to welcome the man behind the mic. In Kentucky, the big birds are, well, wild turkey's a big boy. Yes. Goose, bald eagle, a, a hawk, cranes. These are big birds. How do they rank in size compared to some of the big boys you saw in Kenya? Well, some of them would be very similar. Uh, Kenya has a, a lot of raptors. Um, there's, we saw lots of hawks and eagles that were very large. Of course, the, probably the largest bird we saw there was the ostrich. Ostrich, you know, I don't know how much those things weigh, but when you see them out in the wild, um, you know, you might see them next to a herd of cattle or next to gazelles and other wildlife, and they are just uh, the size of those ostrich are incredible. How tall do they stand? They're about eight foot, six, you know, six to eight feet high. And probably weigh, you know, my guess would be 500 pounds, four or 500 pounds. And that is a non-flying bird. That's that's correct. And then there's several. They have a, a bird called the quarry bustard, which is the largest flying bird, uh, I think, or second largest flying bird. Might have been what we were told. And you know, and it's a large, uh, mostly ground-dwelling raptor. But uh, so that was pretty cool. The secretary bird. Well, you say big. How big was it compared? Uh, I think they weigh forty, a little over forty pounds. Wingspan, uh, probably six to eight feet. Well, Kenya's on the coast of eastern Africa, so there has to be a lot of shorebirds, gulls. Yeah, there are, uh, and we, you know, the normal trip that most people take there does not include the coast. So, and and that's what we had originally planned, and it was, um, so you would have seen the tropical part of the mountains and the forested areas, and then seen the uh, the grasslands and the desert area, the Serengeti part. We extended our trip by about four or five days and made a coastal trip to the Indian Ocean, just because we wanted to see those habitats and pick up some of those other birds that are out on the coast. And that probably allowed us to get about another hundred species or so of birds. In Kentucky, the Nature License Spread Program, when it started back in the middle 90s, had a Kentucky warbler on it, a little yellow bird. And the story that went along with that is that it was a neotropical migratory songbird, which is a fancy way of saying it doesn't live here in the winter. And it flies somewhere in the south where it is warm. Uh, that's Mexico or northern South America, I'm not sure. The argument was because it depends on Kentucky's forest systems for a home we need to pay attention to our habitat here locally and to give it a place to fly home to. Now, I don't know if Central Africa has that type of concern. If the habitats are intact, maybe they're not worried about what's going on uh, in Italy or Johannesburg. A lot of the birds that come and you might say winter in Kenya or further south in Africa that just move through Kenya back to Europe, you know, they're probably their more limiting habitat is in the European end. 
where, you know, with a lot of the North American, South American, Central America migratory birds, I think we have limiting factors on both ends with a lot of the things that's going on in the tropical forest and so forth, deforestation and things. But more constraining even for those is still in the North American side, I would say. Now that you're home, does it make you see Kentucky's habitat and wildlife from a different perspective? What what I saw over there was and, and recognized the most was things happening at a big scale. And whether it was the migration of the animals, and you see it with the large animals uh, that move through that country. I think one the most direct tie that you can make here, and I mentioned earlier, is with our Appalachian Mountain System. And that's an area that we at the Nature Conservancy and the department also is very focused on and and some of our other partners, whether it's the Nature Preserve Commission or Kentucky Natural Land Trust and other partners that we work with. You know, the Appalachian Mountains, we have a huge project we call the Central Appalachians that the Nature Conservancy focuses efforts on. And it's from Pennsylvania through West Virginia, eastern Kentucky, eastern Tennessee, and western Virginia. And so you have this fairly intact large forest system here in the United States that is one of the hot spots for species diversity. A lot of these neotropical migrant birds that you're talking about are totally dependent on the forest system of the Appalachians. And so it's a system that's fairly intact. It does have huge uh, threats. It has already has a lot of uh, impacts of various kinds, whether it's coal mining or just other development in the area that are fragmenting that forest. But if you really look at it at the large whole system scale, there's enough of it still intact that if we focus our efforts, we can work to keep that forest system as a functioning system. So I think maybe the Africa trip, the Kenya, uh, seeing something work at such a large scale there, maybe makes you just realize a little more how important it is to try to think at that big scale. What's the Nature Conservancy do? Well, the Nature Conservancy is a worldwide organization. Uh, it's the largest nonprofit conservation organization in the world. They work in about 40 countries around the world. Here in the United States, every state has a chapter of the Nature Conservancy. And, you know, I work for the Kentucky chapter of the Nature Conservancy. And the primary focus is to, you know, protect the natural systems, uh, kind of look at the best of what's left, try to protect those systems and work with people to manage them in a way that allows for uh, you know, human use and human needs, but also protects the biodiversity or the, you know, the numbers of different types of animals and critters we have, the plants and animals, and protects those habitats so that they're there for future generations to enjoy. So that, that's what we focus on for the largest part. Now, here in Kentucky... Our chapter has three primary focus areas, and one of them I mentioned, you know, is the the Appalachians. Uh, uh, It's basically the Cumberland Mountains and a good chunk of the Cumberland Plateau of Kentucky. The other area that's uh, one of our focus areas is the Green River, and a lot of people don't realize it, but the Green River of Kentucky is one of the highest quality, has the most fish and mussel species, it's one of the best ones in the world. It's it's a global priority, and it's right here in our backyard. The Green River has over 70 mussel species in it, which, you know, a dozen or so of those are, are endangered uh, and, and needing, you know, habitat improvement to bring them back to good levels. It has 150 or so fish species, a lot of crayfish, and different kinds of aquatic things in the Green River, some of them that you don't find anywhere else in the world. So it's a high priority of ours and where we focus a lot of our work. And then our third priority is clear out in the far western end of the state, and it's on the tributaries to the actual Mississippi River. And we're working really hard out there to work with partners like the Natural Resources Conservation Service, the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife, various other folks to restore wetlands. And really that is aimed at still at water quality and trying to look at the whole Mississippi River system. And, you know, we have this huge problem down the Gulf of Mexico that's called hypoxia. It's a big dead zone in the Gulf that's a result of our agricultural runoff up here in Kentucky and Illinois and Indiana and Ohio and so forth. 
the work we're doing there is to try to reduce you know, nutrients and sediment and things from entering the stream so that we can help improve the water quality of the Mississippi River and the Gulf of Mexico. I've been told one thing that gives the Nature Conservancy a leg up is that you're not government. You're a private organization. And if you want, at a whim, you see land for sale, you can buy it. Whereas there are a lot of hoops if you're, well, let's say, a government agency, even maybe the U.S. Forest Service. But you could buy that, hold it, and then hand it off down the road to an agency such as the Nature Preserves Commission that could make use of it and manage it properly. Am I right in that? Yeah, that's a a function, the Nature Conservancy, in all states. But uh, here in Kentucky, we certainly have functioned in that capacity a lot. We can move faster than a state agency or a federal agency to protect some land. Uh, When when a a high-priority piece of ground comes for sale, and this landowner is not willing to wait long enough for uh, the state or federal agency to put together the money and get through the process. We can move a little quicker, maybe go ahead and buy that land, hold on to it to then eventually sell it back to the uh, agency that, that is wanting to have that. We're working right now uh, with uh, you know Kentucky Fish and Wildlife. Uh, we helped with the original purchase out at Sturgis, are hoping to, you know, continue to work out there to help put together uh, a larger wildlife management area in that Sturgis area. So we've done that with the Daniel Boone National Forest, the Nature Preserves Commission, um, different land holding agencies that are in the state. Uh, That is a role the, the Nature Conservancy can play. For anybody wanting to find out more about the Nature Conservancy, what's that web address? Nature.org. Nature.org. And that, that takes you to the, the larger organization's web page, and then you, know, you can click on any state or any country that we work in and get all kinds of information about what the Nature Conservancy is doing. But what's the saying, Jeff? Uh, think globally, act locally? Yeah, that's right. I think you've done that, and uh, we'll continue. Do you have another trip planned? Not yet. Not yet. We're, uh, we don't know what we'll do next, uh, other than... There's still a lot of the United States we haven't seen, so I think we're going to hang around in, in this country for our next couple of trips, but uh, still trying to add to that bird list out west. Jeffrey Soule, thanks so much for coming by. Uh, you're welcome. We'll be back with more in a minute. This is Charlie Baglin on Kentucky Field Radio. The Temptation to Tame the Wild, next on Kentucky Afield Radio. From rabbits to raccoons to deer, spring and summer is that time of year when most wildlife is raising its young. Occasionally, baby wildlife becomes separated from its mother or from its nest, and as we happen upon them in the outdoors, it can be awfully tempting to take one home as a pet. There is an innate nature for us to want to take care of these animals, In 99% of the cases, it's just not the best thing for the animal or for you. Dan Feigert, a wildlife biologist with the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife, says wildlife is called wild for a very good reason. An animal that's raised by a person has no idea maybe how to hunt for itself now or how to uh, find shelter because typically its parents would have showed it how to do that. Now you've done all these things and it doesn't know how to do it in the wild. The objective here clearly is to convince you to leave wildlife where you find it. But doing so can fly in the face of human compassion. From puppies and kittens, what baby creature doesn't want to be held and fed and kept warm? What is the harm? As well-intentioned as we may be, the simple answer is, we don't know how. Newborn fawns, those little legs go kicking around. They may be cute, but they can do a lot of damage. Claws are like razor blades. Alice Norton is a wildlife rehabilitator, a caregiver for orphaned and injured wild animals in central Kentucky. Alice may treat up to 100 animals each year. By summer's end, those fortunate enough to survive are returned to the wild. Meanwhile, her home is their home, but pets, they're not. There's way too much in our own homes that is dangerous. Carpeting, PVC pipe. The wood in our house, it's usually treated. They want to ingest things. It doesn't matter what kind of animal they are. 
bone, fur, and other things we find too disgusting to mention. They find delicious and necessary for proper nutrition, things you'll only find in the wild, not in your kitchen. Foods brought home from the pet care aisle will likely do more harm than good. That aside, baby wildlife don't grow up to be loving pets like cats and dogs. Animals that are cute and cuddly when they're small grow up to be not so cute, not so cuddly. What was feeding from your hand at one point in time might try to bite your hand now. That's their natural way of learning how to survive on their own. Some animals are on their own for their own protection. Rabbits and deer are the first things people pick up that should leave alone because the mother in those cases do not stay with the young. She has a scent and they don't. So if she stayed with her young, she would bring predators straight to them. Important to point out is that taking wildlife can be illegal. Depending on the animal in your care, state and federal laws can come into play. You may be required to have a holding or propagation permit. You may need a special purpose rehabilitation or education permit, which requires you to provide documented evidence that you know what you're doing. Issues all worth discussing with wildlife authorities beforehand. Also, you could bring home more than just a wild critter. Wild animals have all types of diseases that we don't come in contact with on a routine basis. And so if you keep an animal, it might have a disease that you would be susceptible to if you were to come in contact with it. You can domesticate them only to a point. And again, if you do have one that you've domesticated, you better keep him away from any friends or family because if he bites, our state says it must be destroyed and tested. Squirrels, songbirds, chipmunks, rabbits, to name a few, find their way into our yards from time to time. And that's about as close to having a wildlife pet as we need to get. After all, they may be doing us a favor. A lot of people want to keep snakes of all kinds. If you have black or garter snakes, leave him alone and let him be. He'll keep down the mouse population. They do way too much good for us to keep them confined. It's our nature to care for the well-being of animals. And enough has been said about what you can't or shouldn't do. Now here's something you can. If an animal has become legitimately orphaned or injured, contact a wildlife rehabilitator in your area. They have the training and resources to render effective care until it can be returned to suitable habitat. If it's just little, cute, fuzzy, and adorable, let it be fuzzy and cute in the care of Mother Nature. As difficult as it is to resist, please do yourself, your kids, and most of all, the animal a favor by leaving wildlife in the wild. We have uh, two or three minutes left here in the show. The Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife, they welcome a new skipper. A fellow by the name of Greg Johnson is the new commissioner of the state's Wildlife Conservation Agency. A little about his resume, he's retired from the Natural Resources Conservation Service, the NRCS, Farm Bill people. He's from Lexington. He's a lifetime hunter, angler, outdoorsman, Eastern Kentucky University graduate. He spent more than 30 years with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. A lot of that time he worked with farmers and landowners in maintaining healthy and productive working landscapes. Good for agriculture, good for wildlife, good for people. So, Commissioner Greg Johnson is welcome, and we wish him very well in a position. A word or two about some previous commissioners. They all seem to bring particular talents to the position. I began... When Don McCormick was commissioner, this was around 1990, one thing I remember about Don, he loved barbecue, and he felt like Kentucky was left out. This state did not have a national wildlife refuge, but thanks in large part to his leadership, we now have Clarks River National Wildlife Refuge in western Kentucky. Come what was a 1993 commissioner, Tom Bennett, Tom had a full plate. It included such things as the development of the National Archery in the Schools program. We call it NASP. It's all over the state, it's all over the nation, and it's growing all over the world. That was his baby. That was his idea. He restored wild elk to southeastern Kentucky. Tom also thought it was fair to include women in the outdoors, hence the establishment in this state of the Becoming an Outdoors Woman program. Through him, we have now the Salato Wildlife Education Center. School kids love this place. And the Safe Boating Act of 1998. It was about 2005 or so that we welcomed Dr. John Gassett as Commissioner of Fish and Wildlife. And what I liked about John is that he believed more people would fish 
if they had a place to go. Commissioner Gassett was about access. Hence the program, Finns Lakes, F-I-N-S, Fishing in Neighborhoods. 39 lakes now across our state, easy to get to, close to larger cities, stocked and ready to rock. Now we begin a new chapter with Commissioner Greg Johnson, and his quote from the press release says, This isn't just a job for me. Fish and wildlife conservation is what I have committed my whole life to. It's what I do. It's who I am. So a good man is aboard for the coming years. We are out of time. My name is Charlie Baglin. Please join us in a week, and we will go inside outdoors again. Here on Kentucky Field Radio.